currently. Um, we also have a potential to look in some of our uh, existing estates where we could develop a number of small infill schemes, again, which would be suitable to one bed or two bed um, uh, properties that would allow for some downsizing to take place and for people to remain um, in their existing communities. Um, in terms of private development in Fingal, there are um, uh, some developers um, are, have uh, schemes under construction, but um, looking at it um, at the moment, um, and what's on the horizon is still quite small in terms of the, uh, Part 5 units that we expect to be delivered over two th up to 2017. That's somewhere, um, probably with uh, affordable housing bodies, somewhere in the, in the region of 300 Part 5 units. Um, there's definitely, uh, our door is open and we have met a number um, of developers who are interested in how they might collaborate with the local authority uh, to front load some of the development or to front load Part 5 delivery, um, which uh, supports, I think, um, their uh, ability to raise funds and finance, and that's something that we would be keen to explore um, further. Uh, there are also um, <coughs> opportunities we think within our uh, scheme and an analysis of our housing list um, and the income profile of people on our housing list there there are opportunities for people that are on the social housing list at the moment um, who may be in a position to avail of an incremental purchase scheme and we think in some cases a bill to buy model might be something that, that we can look at as well um, the, our relationship with the department is very positive and um, it is very strong and we've been uh, benefited um, from uh, in any situation where we've brought forward proposals for acquisitions or otherwise um, we have benefited from funding at short notice in order to, con to conclude those and I think that's important to note. Um, also uh, with the affordable housing bodies similar to my colleagues in the other Dublin local authorities um, our relationship with the various uh, affordable housing bodies is also very strong and they are very proactive in Fingal and not all uh, situations that you would like to come to fruition do but um, they are, are very much working with us and have a very significant um, role uh, to play in that regard. Um, I suppose just to, to, to wrap up then, um, we do have um, opportunity to bring forward, to, we will meet our targets, in fact we will go beyond meeting our targets and there is opportunity to do that um, and I'm optimistic uh, with the working relationship that we do have with the department and the affordable ha housing bodies that we can achieve that. Ms Gerrity, thank you very much. And I suppose I was encouraged to hear your response in particular where you said in terms of acquisitions, the response from the department was, was quick and I suppose that's encouraging. Uh, I have a number of deputies who have a number of supplementaries. I'd ask you to keep them uh, fairly direct. Deputy O'Sullivan, are you happy or do you want to? Your, thank you. Your, uh, Deputy O'Brien. Two of the questions I asked at the start weren't answered, but I know I'd asked a lot of questions, so it's understandable they slipped through. The first is... And it's a question both to the department and the housing managers. Is it not possible for us to cons consider large scale local authority led mixed tenure, mixed income estates on local authority land funded through a NARPS type vehicle? Um, and again, I suppose I point to the Grange as, as one possi possibility. But is that not something that the department can actively consider? The reason I'm saying that is because it is a little bit more simple than having to come up with a complex arrangement with the private sector. The second thing is sustained communities. It's not that I'm opposed to infill, uh, and, and as Billy knows, I supported a number of them very strongly. It's that on the one hand, the department's policy is that it can't have large-scale local authority build uh, because of the requirements of sustainable communities. But the vast majority of the new build in local authorities is infill in areas where there's already a high concentration, which seems to me a contradiction. And I'm just wondering, maybe the, the department will share what they seem to think is the large body of international research on it, because again, I've yet to come across it. My supplementary question is, I really appreciate that it takes uh, the resources and staff at both departmental level and, and council level uh, to speed up the approval and procurement. Barbara, what's your hope in terms of the, the eventual length of time, if it's 18 months to two years on average currently, you know, would you put a time frame on it of six months, nine months, 12 months, when all of the changes you've outlined are fully implemented? Thank you, Deputy O'Brien. Deputy O'Dowd? I just, there's nothing that I've heard that convinces me that the thousands of families that are homeless uh, would be happy with those houses not going to, going into local authority ownership. Um, 
and I'm not here to criticise and I'm not making any judgments, uh, but I'm just saying that I'm deeply concerned about that. I think at the core of it all is a lack of, uh, underst I'm not being personal, I want to stress that again, the need of people who, who are homeless or in housing is greater than any other issue. Um, and the other point I want to make is those houses were built, okay, some of them had to have works done to them, but it would be far cheaper to be in those homes today than to construct from ab initio of, uh, from the beginning. And the, the last point I want to make is, it, it, sorry, I made this, sorry, there's one other point, that the families who are living in those homes, most of them are living at the moment on rent allowance or housing assistance payments, where they could actually be paying the rent to the council and they would be in their permanent homes as opposed to waiting uh, as maybe for a long period of time. So the final question, it seems to me, and I just see, uh, it seems to me that uh, with all of the expertise in, and uh, in all of the local authorities in the department, that if you all got together as a one-stop shop and said, right, this is it, guys, we're going to look after the GDA area for housing, put all your resources in there, put on your experts, so come them in, and away you go, because other than that, you're just going to have disparate actions, uh, lack of clarity of policy, or certainly not the same policy everywhere, and lack of that drive and that energy which we have to put into this. Thank you. Deputy Brophy. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I suppose what I listened to out of the replies that came through today, I, I, I have to say I didn't find it particularly satisfactory. Um, I want to, to, to make the point that the, the 18 month process, um, what I find particularly disappointing is, uh, Owen alluded to in your contribution, that you have a, the, the exact phrase was a huge list of schemes which you'd like to be bringing forward. Uh, a huge list of schemes which would require an 18 month process. They're not, they're not even launched yet. There were a huge list of schemes you talked about. I, I think I would just say to the department in particular, to everybody, to my mind there is absolutely no reason why at a maximum there cannot be a one and two stop shop process. An initial joint approval by a local authority in the department if it has to be joint approved of a scheme and then an approval and just run with it. I think fundamentally what I've heard today from listening to the replies given by both sides is the point I made earlier on. Whether it's controller and auditor general, whether it's local government auditor, whatever process it is. There just does not seem to be a willingness to give someone the authority to go out and do the job without people wanting to be involved in second guess. And anecdotally, I'm afraid I've heard that stuff comes into the department and takes weeks um, to, to come back. And I think it is, it, it's something that you really need to solve because I think on allowing for the level of the crisis we face, I think to even be advocating or to be outlining that something may take 18 months is just not acceptable. The other thing I'd just like to put on record, and um, while just to confirm I am not in, in Deputy Durkin's league, but the AHBs um, are not a solution to the problem. They are a contributory element. They will never be at the level of being able to provide a solution. And I worry greatly when I hear references to them as contributing in a significant way, because it's not even a matter of whether or not they're provided with finance or whether or not they're provided with whatever. And they don't want to gear up to the level and size that is necessary to tackle this problem. And I would make the point that the only body who is capable of tackling it is the local authorities. They're the only people who are capable of tackling it. And I think what is needed now, and I hope the Minister, and I have no doubt the Minister will, in conjunction with the feedback he gets from this uh, committee, will put in place a process. But there needs to be, I believe, just a complete sea change. The sustainability thing seems to have come around to the heart of this. I go back again to the point, and actual fact from the initial contribution made by yourselves to a point later on, you did seem to move on what sustainable development should be. But we will need to go back to building much larger quantities of um, houses and uh, acknowledging the fact that if we do that building right, and it's not, you know, appreciate the comment made uh, by the manager, but when I talked about 
a community being built and the necessity for schools and churches and everything. I wasn't asking for local authorities to necessarily build those immediately. I was talking about the fact that what was done in the past was the local authorities built the houses and then walked away from uh, proper planning and development of the community. Uh, because no one's asking necessarily that everything be built by the local authority, but it needs to be managed and planned and thing put in place. And I believe we can build modern communities on a scale and a size necessary to solve it in both the public and private sector together. But the primary driver needs to be the local authority sector, and it needs to want to do it in a much faster process than I heard indicated today. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Coppinger. Yeah, uh, one of the things I've never liked is the way here in the Dáil that the local authorities are f frequently blamed by government for the lack of house building or the housing crisis. Um, you, you will hear ministers saying, oh, we've given them the money, we've told them to, the Taoiseach said, to go and you know work away with that. Um, but I have to say, I am very disappointed with what I'm hearing today, because basically what the local authority <coughs> managers are saying is, listen, we're meeting all our targets, we're actually going to exceed them. Yeah, but homelessness is doubling. And, you know, it's no comfort to people out there that you're ticking your boxes. The point is, I think a number of TDs at least, I'm not sure about everyone on this committee, local authorities were once the vehicle for social housing and affordable housing. By the way, it wasn't just social housing. There were other, you know, there was an affordable mortgage scheme as well for people who weren't on the list. But now it seems that uh, they're being sidelined by obviously these approved housing bodies. Uh, like Fingal just basically said that, uh, I know the situation well in, for example, in Greater Blanchardstown where we have an acute homeless problem because we're the youngest area, I think, in, in probably in Western Europe, but certainly in the country. We also have the highest um, ethnic mix, which actually leads to a lot of homelessness, because a lot of non-nationals become homeless. They don't have the same. They're so reliant on the private rented sector. But to hear, like, Fingal saying we're meeting our targets, I mean, there's, there's 15 and a half acres left in Blanchardstown that the council owns that's owned in Mulhuddard. That's all. There's nothing else left. Everything else is in the hands of either NAMA or private developers. So, um, you know, the, the, the Fingal target, no wonder you're meeting it. It's 1,376. Like, but there's 10,000 on the housing list. So, the, the housing targets are being deliberately set low. That's my point. Either by central government and obviously the, the councils. Now, I feel sorry for the managers. They can't come in here and start giving out about the government. You know, obviously not. But I would love to hear them saying that they want more money, that they want to be able to build more houses. But instead, what I'm hearing is, in Fingal and the others, it's, it's a third is going to be construction or acquisition, a third is approved housing bodies roughly, and a third is private sector. So the whole role of the local authorities is completely shrinking. How are we going to meet and then house the 100,000 people on the housing list if, if you are happy with your shrinking role? Um, just on the, the other thing, I, this is laying the foundations. It's April. It's the most up-to-date document, right? Um, why are the targets, for example, in, in, in Dublin? And, and Cork, obviously, and other cities and towns, I know, but Dublin is where most of the homelessness at the moment is. Why are they so low? That's where most of the homelessness is. So, for example, in Fingal, you'll meet 10% of your target. That's what the target is, just to house 10% of the people on the list. Similarly with uh, Dublin City Council. You know, it really is a joke. I mean, how are we going to... Uh, we're meant to have the biggest housing crisis and the biggest response, but yet we're just setting a target of 10% of the people being housed. Um, just the other thing is on this thing about acquisitions, I do think a point has been made by Deputy O'Dowd in terms of some of the NAMA offerings, because this is going to become an issue now. Everyone's well aware of Tyrrellstown. We have had the, the tenants in here. Um, but also in Dublin City Council today, I see another potential mass eviction on the cards and what I would ask the managers is to be much more open than they seem to be to acquiring units with people in situ. The reality is a lot of them are on the housing list. 
you know, and they are paying a huge amount in rent. But to turn down offers of, you know, 100 or 200 units because there's people living in them isn't really good enough anymore, given, and it's not your fault, that the government encouraged this policy of vulture fund and investment fund buying property en masse. So in Middle Gardner Street today, for example, I'm reading that there's, um, the estate agents are advertising the properties for sale. I think um, Deputy Wallace mentioned another site earlier on um, where the rent can go up by 49%. That's what they're actually offering as the, the carrot now. And we have to be open to compulsory purchasing or purchasing through the local authorities or agencies these, these types of units. Similarly, in Tyrrellstown, I'm hoping that Fingal County Council is seriously negotiating to purchase those houses and not just thinking, oh, that's not going to do anything for our social housing list. You know, because actually a lot of the people are on the list and if you don't buy them, they will be on in the homeless situation. So um, I would agree there that we have to look at that again. And just very lastly, on what the local authorities are saying, I, I would be concerned as well about speeding things up. We have an emergency here. And as I said, the tendering thing is, is a real problem. It, it shows you how, if it was direct build, as I said earlier, you could, you could shorten it. But this idea of a master plan, I've been on councils, I've sat through development plans, and I'm not saying we should have shoddy planning by any means, but a master plan could take ages. The, if, if that's the last piece of land that can be developed by the council in the whole of Greater Blanchardstown population of 100,000, I'd be a bit worried that we're doing a big master plan that could take ages. We have to speed up the development of these sites. Deputy, and just to conclude, I have one or two. Oh, sorry, Deputy Moore. Sorry, sorry. Thanks very much, Minister. It's not going to be easy to solve the problem. I'm a realistic person that's down below in the Longford Westmead constituency, and I know how hard it is from a, a local uh, public representative when I was there trying to get over the hurdles that the county managers and everybody else. Is there a phone somewhere? No, I'm not, not mine. Sir. Okay, continue. But I, I want to put a question. A lot of the focus is in relation to uh, the cities, and we can't forget the rural areas as well. And I'm talking about buying land. Have you any put forward in proposals to buy land for local that don't have land? Have you looked at the, the like of the semi-state body of CEE that will hold huge land banks of land that are sitting there quite clearly can be used for development in relation to social affordable housing and even for private uh, development as well. And in relation then to the county managers, and I suppose in relation to us all in the room, we all can start preaching and practising, but this, the, the local authority has been starved of money for the last number of years, and now that the focus is back on, and rightly so, because we find ourselves in a very difficult situation. But I would far prefer, because the four of you here today, and the four of you just read out exactly that if I went on your website uh, at every meeting, that's what you tell your local representatives. For me, we're legislators. We need you to come and tell us what you'd like us to do to speed up the process. We are the people that have to make the decisions. And we can all be in here, lads, and girls criticising each and every one of us. But we're here together as a group, trying to find a solution to a very difficult problem. And I think if we could get some indication from the local authorities, what you'd like us to to speed up the process in relation to yourselves, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, just before I hand over, just two, two brief questions. I'm not going to repeat any of the points that were made. But to the department in your opening, comment, uh, you talked about the fast track scheme for developments up to two, 15 housing units and 2 million. I suppose I was wondering uh, how, how frequently is that used? Because obviously the committee, uh, and it has been indicated by the minister, the capacity is there to increase the size of the scheme. And have local authorities got concerns about entering the scheme that if there are unforeseen eventualities that they can't go back to the department to revisit for additional funding and that? So just how is that scheme working? And if it were to be increased you know, is it, does it address concerns that I think local authorities have in terms of risk and unidentified? And to the local authorities, just two very uh, brief things. One is, I don't know of uh, private accommodation in local authorities, if any local authorities have an audit of vacant or unused, because it's one of the things that the committee has been presented with, the number of un, unoccupied 
properties and other private properties, but if local authorities have an audit of that. And finally, it's more a comment, uh, I suppose it'd be remiss of me not to relay it, uh, having met, um, I suppose, a group of homeless people with focus yesterday. One of the comments they make is in relation to accessing the phone service for homelessness um, that it, with great difficulty. And I suppose they all tell their own, sta their own story. And one of, the, one of the comments they make is when they're dealing with local authorities in as far as possible, you know, they would like to try, and I know it's not always practical, to have a relationship with an individual that, you know, rather than meeting different people and starting their case every day. They were just some of the things relayed to us yesterday, and I thought it would be remiss not to mention it in this forum today because what was the point in meeting them if we didn't, you know, uh, I suppose, identify some of their issues. Um, you've heard a whole range of supplementary, so maybe we'll start with the department Sorry, and... Chair, I just might yes. come back sure. about the homeless uh, families that you, that you met yesterday. Um, I suppose it, 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 I couldn't let it go without saying that my staff on a daily basis are dealing with uh, homeless families and individuals uh, and, uh, as far as I'm concerned, are dealing with them in the most humane way uh, possible. Uh, and yes, there may be issues in relation to uh, some of the services, but I can safely say uh, that the team of people that we have working in, in the homeless area are extremely well trained, are extremely well motivated, and they go the extra mile or the extra yard or whatever it takes in order to be humane and to treat the citizens of this city who happen to be homeless uh, in, the best, uh, in, the best possible, uh, in the best possible way. Uh, I suppose the issues in relation to, the, to phone services is that I suppose there's limited amount of accommodation and when people ring, you know, you have to go and find the accommodation. And I know for, for uh, so people on the end of the phone uh, you know, that's an absolute travesty. Uh, but until such time as we crack the main problem here, and the main problem is supply, until we crack that, that, that position, we're going to have an over-reliance on a homeless system which was never designed to tackle or to deal with the level of uh, service users that are coming to us at this, at this point in time. Thank you. Just on that really quick, could you end the self-accommodation thing, which is torture for people, if you had more staff? Because it, it's really difficult for people to source their own accommodation like that. The, the position in relation to uh, self-accommodation is not necessarily one of, of uh, having staff. It, it's a question of when people come to us at a certain time of the day or night, and when we actually haven't got anything left on the books. Uh, you know, we, we, we'll continue to try, but, you know, the persons themselves can also uh, uh, help by, you know, finding a hotel or whatever to, to, for the evening. Uh, but that, that, that's a forced night situation. We generally catch up the next day in relation to accommodation uh, afterwards. It is an emergency situation that you need to uh, work on in order to ensure a family and children don't find themselves on the side of the street uh, uh, at night. And, uh, and unfortunately, that is the position. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Um, there were a series of supplementaries. Uh, I'll start with the department um, and uh, we'll finish then through the local authorities. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy O'Brien, uh, your questions. The, the question of why couldn't we have a large-scale local authority-led mixed income, mixed tenure development, what I would say in response to that is that the Minister has indicated that he is open to all suggestions in terms of the action plan for housing, so we'll certainly bring it back and put it, put it into the mix. Um, in relation to uh, the, the research, um, I, I don't have the details of the international research here now, but what I would say in response to all of the concerns that have been voiced here about sustainable communities is that the concept is not intended as a straitjacket. It's a guideline to be applied pragmatically. And what we really want to do is to avoid over-concentration of mono-tenure and indeed mono-income, as Deputy Coppinger mentioned, estates. And there are, I would acknowledge, there are successful examples of, of uh, local authority housing estates which have worked well. So in, it, it's not just about planning um, and infrastructure. It's also about management of housing estates. And so 
on, and we're very much aware of that. Um, but uh, in many cases where the local authority housing estates have been successful, they have been in a broader context of being surrounded by other mixed tenure and uh, mixed income um, areas. Um, finally, in, in relation to the 18 months to two years process, rather than putting a timeline on how long the approval process would take, I would be more focused on outcomes. And what I would like to see and what my hope would be is that we will achieve the targets. In fact, I am confident that we will achieve the targets that I outlined earlier. The numbers of starts that are going to be in place at the end of this year and the number of, of those who are going to be in place by the end of 2017, as we foresaw, as we funded back in, in 2015. Um, and in relation to um, you know, how many projects are approved, um, our, our records show that there are 16 live capital projects uh, in Dublin City Council, for example, with over 600 units underway. Um, and uh, there's, there's, um, Deputy O'Dowd, for example, uh, said that the needs of people who are homeless were not being acknowledged, but in fact, our, our, all of our uh, efforts in terms of social housing strategy are about meeting the needs of people with home, who are homeless because the ultimately, that, you're, that are offered. That's the ultimately, question. ultimately, it's about a question of supply. The and, supply um, is there, and you didn't the additional it. thing we've done in relation to homelessness, as you know, is the rapid build uh, approach, where we have ad additional units over and above the units that are in the capital programmes um, of the four local authorities. We're, we're supplying the, the rapid build. On the question of the one-stop shop, um, the, the idea of having a single authority to, um, to address housing was considered, um, we, informally we discussed it in the department, and we considered the length of time it would take to put in place the structures for a new organisation and uh, agreeing budgets, agreeing structures, pulling staff in. The experience in the public service is that all the energy could possibly, there was a risk that all the energy would go into creating the new structure rather than getting on with the job. So what we've done instead in the department is we have this cross-divisional team which is a pulling together internally without the need for formal structures of the expertise across the department to focus on the measures required for the Housing Action Plan and also then of course as the Minister mentioned pulling together all of the resources across government in the Cabinet Committee and in the Senior Officials Group. So that's the way we're, we're, we're going um, and, and uh, while the, I, I appreciate what Deputy O'Dowd has said about the NBA in the past, the NBA as, as it existed no longer exists. The it's, skills so still there. The skills, the it's skills, the skills we are, we're, we're pulling about, together. Um, uh, any, um, uh, uh, Deputy Brophy talked about uh, anecdotal evidence of very long delays. Um, we have outlined how we want to and, and are in the process of improving things and I think we got some acknowledgement from the local authorities that proce projects have been uh, progressing. But if, you, if, you, if there is any particular project about which you have concerns, I'd be happy to take details from you um, at any stage and we can, we can follow it up. Um, I will ask my colleague, uh, Philip Newman, to comment shortly about the, the um, issue of the AHBs and their capacity or otherwise to, to contribute um, to developing um, and delivering on the social housing strategy. I do think they do have capacity and that the capacity can be built, but I would be the first to acknowledge that they are not the entire solution. In fact, the reality is that there is no magic bullet here. There is a range of different proposals and solutions that we have to go for. Um, Deputy Coppinger mentioned that local authorities are frequently blamed for lack of progress. I would like to put it on the record that we are not blaming local authorities and we, for lack of progress, and I didn't blame anybody. No, but not you, the ministers. Themselves. And neither do I think that local authorities are being sidelined. In fact, I think what has happened, and very clearly from the time of the social housing strategy, is that local authorities are back centre stage in building um, uh, social housing. But again, the reality is that they, they, they are not the entire solution. It has to be multifaceted. And um, while as officials we don't comment on the merits or otherwise of policy, there have been a number of comments made about the, our, the policy of relying on the private sector. What I would say to this committee, if you want to take it into consideration if you're making recommendations, is that the strategy that we had in the social housing strategy of local authority, approved housing body and private sector was in part as a result of the availability of funding. 
There, we have a limited amount of exchequer funding. You would have heard from my colleagues in the Departments of Finance and Public Expenditure about the constraints of exchequer funding. So the approved housing bodies can be off balance sheet. The private sector can do their piece. We have a limited amount of exchequer funding. So all of those things need to be taken into account uh, in, in considering um, that particular issue. Um, uh, in, uh, Deputy Moran talked about whether we could buy lands, um, whether local authorities could buy lands, including Erin O'Daren, and I'll ask my, my colleague Colin Ryan to talk about our land strategy uh, because we have been looking at, at those issues. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Chair, you had a question yourself about our two million uh, uh, scheme and how much is, is it used. It has only been in place since January, so it's early days yet. We've had a number of inquiries from local authorities um, and uh, the, the reaction has been mixed. In some local authorities, they wouldn't see it as an option. In other local authorities, they have welcomed it and, and are interested in using it. Um, but to date, we've had no formal applications. Yeah. Thank you. And your colleagues are going to... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, Deputy Murphy, as, as Barbara has, has said, I mean, I, I guess we need to think about what, what we need. And what we need is a, a multi-stranded approach to what is a, uh, a massive supply challenge. Um, and that means that we need all hands to the, to the wheel. We need the local authorities in the game. We need the private sector delivering. And we also need AHBs to deliver as well. Now, approved housing bodies traditionally have been reliant on a grant, 100% capital funded uh, model. Uh, the 2011 housing policy statement envisaged a, an enhanced role for AHBs, and, and that required them to go on a journey, a very quick journey from 100% capital funded to uh, a, a loan finance model. And to be fair, the state asked them to do that in a very truncated timeline over a period of a couple of years where in other jurisdictions that's taken 20 years or, or more. So I think it's, it's important to acknowledge the, the very quick transition that many of, many of the AHBs have made. You're absolutely right. They're not a panacea. They're not going to deliver um, on their own the, the types of numbers that are required. But at the same time, they have the capacity and have shown in the past that they have the capacity to deliver thousands of units annually. And that's thousands of units that we should absolutely accept. So I think they, they have, a, they have an, an important role to play and I think it's worth acknowledging, particularly those larger AHBs that have engaged with the HFA funding model and that have got the, the certified borrower status, they have a significant contribution to play. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ryan, come the, the Thank land. you, Chair. Just in relation to the land, I suppose there's a number of strategies that have to be looked at in relation to the release of land, in particular in relation to CIE and other state agencies and other state bodies. That, that was raised, I think, this morning by Deputy O'Dowd, and the Minister has undertaken that we would look at those in terms of how that can be brought to bear at appropriate locations, but there are issues around the commerciality of these things and the location, but that's a matter that is being um, followed up at the present moment in time. And on behalf of the managers, Mr Cummins. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, just getting back to your first question really in relation to the um, up to 15 housing, the 15 units and the 2 million, and you asked if, we, if the local authorities had any concerns in relation to financial, if, if you recall. Uh, the last point I made today on behalf of my colleagues throughout the uh, country is the whole area of risk appetite. And I, and I said that you know, financial risk overruns must be shared by all stakeholders. You know, so uh, you know, just, just to say that. that so no concerns that the, your, the, the local authorities are once they sign up to the scheme, are taking the burden of the risk? Yeah, and, and, and in some cases, okay. and in some cases that, that won't be the case, but um, I think it's important to, to, to everywhere, everyone to accept that there's a risk appetite that has to be borne by everyone, and uh, the, the risk cannot be transferred in its entirety to local authorities. Okay. Thank and you. Uh, we've discussed that with, with the department as well, I might add. Um, I think today maybe it's very important to highlight what, what we don't want. You know, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past, um, and we certainly don't want to have people staying and rearing their families out of one and two bed rooms and hotels. And we know what they go through, I can assure you. And um, it is, as you know, Deputy Coppinger, most disheartening and, and upsetting uh, to, to, to see what these people are going through. What we do want, though, uh, we want all the players back into uh, the business of providing houses in this country, including the banks. Um, in relation to uh, Deputy Morden, um, you know, he's not here, but he made the point that local authorities were not awash with money. 
And uh, in terms of buying land, you know, the department are working with us in terms of if we identify sites or pieces of land that we can build social housing, the department are working hand in hand with us. And uh, I, if I could say that in the next few days, we in Roscommon, uh, which doesn't have a huge need, but we will actually be bidding for land. So just to make that point as well. And in relation to the unoccupied private properties, certainly there are significant numbers of unoccupied private properties around the country, holiday homes, we're all familiar with them. And whereas each local authority wouldn't have a separate audit of them, but we do have an idea what the numbers are in terms of some work that the housing agency has done. And also in the next few months, as the, cons as the census results return, we'll have a complete picture of that and maybe able to have some um, actions on that at some stage. And, and finally, from my point of view, um, you know, Deputy Cabinger, you know, the shrinking role of the local authority. Certainly, I think in relation to social housing provision, our role did shrink, um, you know, some years ago. But that is clearly um, not the case now. And our it's a primary. The provision of social housing is a primary function and purpose of all local authorities um, in the state. And. Um, I don't know, Owen, did you want to add? add, add the only answer? point I would make is in response to Deputy O'Brien's suggestion in relation to <clears throat> would we be prepared to bring forward a complete development of sites? And we, we have identified a number of sites uh, which are uh, in our ownership, uh, properly zoned, serviced, need site development works. The constraint, our own members have said there has to be a 30% social housing element. Um, if certainly, and it looks much more positive, we get the funding for that, then the question of bringing forward the balance of that site is something we're going to look at. That would, we would see that a combination of cost rental and affordable, and that's something we'd certainly look at. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, that concludes our meeting this afternoon. At this stage, I would like to thank uh, the officials from the department, uh, some of whom I know had a very, very long day because you were here this morning, and the members of the CCMA um, for your attendance, your presentations, and to be fair, your direct and honest answers with the committee. They've been very helpful and informative. To my colleagues of the committee, that concludes our session with witnesses, and next Tuesday morning uh, we will meet at 10.30 to start drafting our report. So, Thank you to all who attended and we adjourn till Tuesday at 10.30am. Thank you very much.